You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. Hello, and welcome to a special bonus episode of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. Now, in our last episode, episode 307, Michael Haddam helped us investigate the role that history played in the American Revolution and the ways that early historians used history as a tool to help unite Americans as one people after the revolution. Plus, he also helped us better understand how the first histories of the United States have really impacted our memory of the revolution and of early America. Well, in today's bonus episode, we're going to get back together with Michael Haddam so that we can explore a few topics that we just didn't have time to talk about in our full-length episode. A listener questioned about how British Americans thought about the British Empire's responsibility to protect them, and historical schools of thought, how those schools of thought developed, and the different schools of historical thought when it comes to the American Revolution. Essentially, Michael is going to take us on a whirlwind tour of the history of history writing when it comes to the American Revolution or what historians like to call the historiography of the American Revolution. But first, this bonus episode is a sample of the kinds of bonus episodes that you could be receiving each month as a subscriber to the Ben Franklin's World subscription program. Each month, subscribers to the Ben Franklin's World subscription program receive ad-free versions of each new episode and monthly bonus episodes on the last Friday of each month. These perks are a big thank you from me and the Omohundro Institute because each subscriber to the Ben Franklin's World subscription program really helps support the production of this podcast. Now, while many podcasts like Ben Franklin's World are free for you to listen to, they are not free to produce. The OI's digital audio team and I invest one hour of labor into each minute that you hear in an episode. And when we do those special narrative episodes, like the one you just heard in episode 306, we spend about two hours of labor into each minute that you hear on this podcast. So yeah, it really just takes a lot of time and money to produce this podcast, which is why the Omohundro Institute and I could really use your help to keep it going. You love great historical scholarship, and we love helping scholars introduce you to their great historical scholarship. So please help us continue this work by joining the Ben Franklin's World subscription program. Visit benfranklinsworld.com slash subscribe. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash subscribe. Thank you. And now let's go rejoin historian Michael Haddam. Thank you so much for staying on with us, Michael, and for taking the time to answer a few additional questions about the revolution and the histories of the revolution. Now, to begin, Rosa wonders if you could tell us about how British Americans came to believe that it was Great Britain's responsibility to protect them. She also wonders whether Americans blame Great Britain for protecting them too much by prohibiting their movement west of the Appalachians and therefore west of the Proclamation Line of 1763. Yeah, so this is a really interesting question. Thank you, Rosa. This idea of Britain's responsibility to the colonies, it's always the case that British American colonists believed they were under the protection of England in the 17th century and then Britain in the 18th century. But the question that arises during the imperial crisis and has to do with, you know, we were talking about the Glorious Revolution before, is who in Britain has the responsibility to protect the colonies and also who has the authority to tell the colonies what to do? It's accepted in Britain and largely in the colonies throughout the first half of the 18th century, that parliament can basically tell the colonies what to do, except, of course, in issues of taxation because of historical reasons going back to the civil wars in the 1640s in England. But, you know, over the course of the crisis, colonists come up with a different answer to that question, which is basically, you know, they start to argue that only the king has the authority to rule over them And they expected to be protected by the king from parliament. And of course, after the coercive acts in 1774, 
following the Boston Tea Party, Americans, you know, start to increasingly appeal to the king directly to say, can you step in and intervene here? Like, can you tell parliament that they need to pull back? And it's really the last nail in the coffin toward independence when colonists realize that there's no chance that the king is going to intervene on their behalf. Chris reminds us of the saying that history is written by the victors. So he'd like to know, what lens modern researchers and students of history should use when they read historical texts about the pre-revolutionary era in the early United States? So Michael, what Chris would like to know is, how should we read and recognize early historians' biases against women, Native Americans, and the enslaved? Yeah, this is a really important sort of question. I don't know that there's some specific you know, methodology, like steps to take to do that. I think it's something that anybody approaching primary sources from the period needs to hold in the foreground of their mind. I mean, I can give you an example. In the book, I talk about the role of Native Americans in these early national histories. And historians have often pointed out that early national Americans looked at Native Americans as quote unquote, the other, right? And that they define themselves in opposition to the ways they define Native Americans. And that was common, but in the realm of history culture specifically, I found something very different. So for example, one French writer in the early 19th century complained that many American natural history writers had basically taken it upon themselves to become the defenders of Native Americans. And, you know, when I looked at what they were writing and why, it became clear that they were writing about Native Americans, these historians, in very sort of surprisingly what might seem like sympathetic ways. But, you know, having that broader context that Chris mentions was very useful in trying to understand what's going on here. So what I was able to realize by keeping those issues in the foreground in my mind while looking at these sources was that basically they're treating Native Americans in this way for entirely utilitarian purposes. And they're basically co-opting the history of Native American peoples for this national project of creating a national history and a national identity. And eventually, you know, I talk about the different ways in which they depict Native Americans and the reasons behind those depictions. And ultimately, I came to the conclusion that what they were really doing was effectively appropriating the indigenous history of the continent for their own nationalist purposes. So I think it's less a methodology and just more a perspective. You know, if you're aware of these inherent biases in people in the 18th century relative to now, but when you're looking at sources, if you think deeper about how those biases may have played out in the source that you're reading, it varies so much that there's no real step-by-step prescription for it. It's just something that, you know, historians need to keep in mind. So I have a two-part question for you. In your book, Past and Prologue, you did a really outstanding job of outlining the different schools of interpretive thought when it comes to the American Revolution. So really, the first part of my question is, could you tell us what an interpretive school of thought is and how schools of thought develop? Yeah, so this has to do with historiography, right? Which is, historiography is basically the study of history, of historical writing. And it's also the history of historical writing. And within historiography, we use this phrase interpretive school, which is basically a collection of historians or historical works that share some common thread in their arguments about a certain topic, right? So if a few historians around the same time analyze an event like, say, the American Revolution, using an economic perspective or lens or making an argument about the importance of economics, we tend to categorize them as an interpretive school. But that really is just mostly a sort of shorthand way to think about historiographical changes. It doesn't suggest that they were, say, coordinating their arguments in some way, though, you know, that has been the case here and there. Sometimes an interpretive school comes out of a certain place, like the progressive historians in the Midwest, and specifically from the University of Wisconsin at Madison in the early part of the 20th century. Sometimes they develop from a certain historian like Bernard Balin, who had a number of his grad students 
that chose to further explore his own line of interpretation regarding the revolution in the 1960s and 1970s. But I mean, I would say no matter how or where they develop, interpretive schools, like all historians individually, are unavoidably shaped by their own contemporary political, cultural, and social contexts. And those contexts shape both historians' answers, but also their questions. Thank you for that overview, because my next question is a bit of a follow-up. Now that we know what interpretive schools of historical thought are, could you tell us about the different interpretive schools of historical thought when it comes specifically to the American Revolution? Like, what are the different interpretive schools of thought about the American Revolution? Yeah, so this is one of my favorite topics. This is a thing I, I've been interested in for a really long time, which is the historiography of the American Revolution and basically how historians have thought about the revolution, how that's changed over time. And so if we're talking about, you know, after the revolutionary generation, the first major interpretation of the revolution and U.S. history generally was the Whig interpretation of the 19th century. And this is most identified with a man named George Bancroft. And he was this sort of elite Boston patrician who held a few government posts and spent much of the sort of second half of his life writing an extensive multi-volume history of the United States. And this is sort of right in the years around and before and after the Civil War. And the Whig interpretation was defined by a few things. So Bancroft and those who followed him, they saw history as linear and progressive, right? Like we talked about earlier, that sort of only began to develop around the time of the revolution. And Bancroft really bought into that perspective on the past. And in his mind, U.S. history was the story of the sort of transition away from the tyranny of old world monarchy to the liberty of the Republican new world. And that's his grand narrative. And the other thing that's important about them is that they believed, and this is writing that's coming you know, in the wake of the Second Great Awakening, they thought of history as being directed by providence, by God. So you can sort of see some of the ways in which Bancroft, who was this sort of small D Democrat who came of age during the Second Great Awakening, you could see how those two things sort of intersected to help shape his perspective. Now, in the early 20th century, there are two important new schools that arise in reaction to the older Whig interpretation. And this is usually how all new schools arise, you know, reacting to a previous interpretation. And so the first is the progressive school or the progressive historians like Charles Beard or Carl Becker. And they begin to think about the revolution not as this divinely ordained march toward liberty, but instead they focused on class conflict in the revolution. And their idea was what we tend to call the dual revolution idea, which basically argued that the revolution was both a struggle with Britain over who would rule the colonies, and at the same time, an internal struggle between elites and non-elites over who would rule you know, in the colonies. And they really believed that ideas did not matter in motivating people, and that for the revolution generally, what really mattered was economic interest. And so they dismissed all of the patriot rhetoric about liberty and tyranny that Bancroft, you know, loves so much, and they basically, you know, counted it out as just cover for all of the elite patriots' self-interest. The other challenge that came to the Whig interpretation in the early 20th century was from the imperial school. And these were historians right around the turn of the 20th century, just as the historical profession was becoming an actual thing, academic historical profession. And these historians thought that Bancroft's portrayal of the Americans as the good side and Britain as the evil side was too simplistic. So they went back and they studied the relationship between the colonies and Britain before the revolution. And what they found was that the colonies really had not been treated that badly, relatively speaking. So they argued that not only was independence not justified, but Charles Andrews, who was one of the more sort of notable imperial historians, even once said that revolutionary Americans had basically died for a false creed. And the context that's important for the imperial school is that this is right around the time of what's called the Great Reproachment, which is 
when the United States and the United Kingdom finally begin to become allies, which sets the stage for their relationship throughout the 20th century. But think about it. It's kind of hard to have positive diplomatic relations with a country who plays the role of evil villain in your national historical memory. Moving on from there, if we go to the 1950s, we get a response to this sort of conflict-ridden progressive interpretation in the context of the Cold War, in this school that we typically call the Consensus School. And these historians were working at a time when the United States was trying to define itself in opposition to the Soviet Union and to communism. And so they focused their interpretations of the revolution on a few core principles of liberalism that they argued were widely shared and that define the nation's origins. And those were the sanctity of private property and the value of self-interest for economic prosperity. And you can see how those two ideas contrast neatly with the collectivism of Soviet communism and how they promote the increasing identification of the new United States origins with capitalism. And then in reaction to the consensus historians and to progressive historians, in the mid-1960s, there arose what we tend to call the neo-Whig or ideological school. It's sometimes called neo-Whig because these historians focused on ideas, sort of like Bancroft, though very differently. They believe that the progressive historians had gone too far in dismissing the importance of ideas in the revolution. And the major work of this school was The Ideological Origins of the American Revolution by Bernard Balin, which came out in the mid-1960s. And he basically argued that you could explain the coming of the revolution through colonist adherence to this sort of very old Republican ideology that sort of stressed civic virtue and was really concerned with, you know, the corruptible and conspiratorial nature of power. And that's why colonists were so suspect of parliament and what they were doing. And then I would say, you know, in the late 60s and 1970s, you know, we start to see the rise of women's history and African American history as broader topics within early American history. But it's really at the end of the 1970s that we get the neo progressive school. This is all like a cycle. You can see the neo progressives thought that the neo Whigs overplayed the importance of ideas, just like the progressives did to George Bancroft. And so they wanted to complicate that story by thinking more about class conflict. Then later about the importance of groups that were often left out of these histories of ideas. In some sense, the neo-progressives kind of co-opt women's history and early African American history, at least in relation to the revolution. And there have been some minor sort of school-like developments since the 1980s and 1990s, but many historians of early America today are still very much working within that neo-progressive paradigm of conflict and of, you know, trying to understand the disparities that shaped the American Revolution. And so I don't want to go on longer than that, but I will say I created a digital timeline, a multimedia timeline of the historiography of the revolution that I'm happy to share with listeners who are interested in learning more about this fascinating topic. Be sure to check out our full-length conversation with Michael Haddam in episode 307, which you can find at benfranklinsworld.com slash 307. This bonus episode is a sample of the kinds of bonus episodes that you could be receiving on the last Friday of each month as a subscriber to the Ben Franklin's World subscription program. Please help us keep this podcast going. Become a subscriber at benfranklinsworld.com slash subscribe. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash subscribe. Production assistance for this podcast comes from the Omahundro Institute's digital audio team. Joseph Edelman, Martha Howard, Holly White, and Karen Wolf. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. All right, this podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. To discover and listen to their other shows, visit airwavemedia.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omahundro Institute.